Hello, this is Mr. After All. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the structure question in the AQA language exam. Um, it will be the structure question is in paper one, and it's always going to be question three where you're asked about structure. And this is a particularly tricky question because most of the other questions ask you to talk about language and we're kind of used to doing that because we do that in literature and we, we're doing that all the time. But structure is something quite different to language and we just need to know how to approach this properly if we're going to pick up marks for this question. So it's an eight mark question. and I'm just going to try and give you a little bit of guidance, a little bit of advice, some things that you may say. Obviously, you have to respond to whatever's in front of you, but things that commonly you might say. Um, so a few phrases that are useful in terms of the structure question. The phrases that I'd encourage you to think about using are switches focus to. So when you're reading something and it's discussing one thing and then it changes to something else. You can describe the writer switching focus from one thing to another thing. Uh, the second one is zooms in on. So if something is described in small detail, you can describe it as zooming in on that detail. Um, and the other two are, are, are kind of similar words which you can use either contrasts or, or juxtaposes or juxtapositions. And that's when two things that are very, very different are, are next to each other. So contrasts are when things differ. Juxtaposition is when you've got two to things that are next to each other, that are deliberately put next to each other because they're so different. So, so those three phrases are really, really useful to remember in terms of structure. They're not the only things to remember in terms of structure, but they're really, really useful. And your job in this question is basically to read the text and to make comments about why things are in the order they are. So structure is, you start with one thing, follows, then another thing follows, then another thing follows, then another thing follows. And you'll be asked why those things are in that order and how those things being in that order interests you as a reader. Um, so I'm, I'm going to use a small extract because otherwise um, it's difficult to talk just without an extract to hand. So I'm reading from this book here, which is uh, by Julian Barnes, it's called Arthur and George. So I'm just going to read the beginning of it briefly and then talk about the kind of things I might say about this, this extract. So this is the opening of the book. A child wants to see... It always begins like this, and it began like this then. A child wanted to see. He was able to walk and could reach up to a door handle. He did this with nothing that could be called a purpose, merely the instinctive tourism of infancy. A door was there to be pushed. He walked in, stopped, looked. There was nobody to observe him. He turned and walked away, carefully shutting the door behind him. When he saw, what he saw there became his first memory. A small boy, a room, a bed, closed curtains, leaking afternoon light. By the time he came to describe it publicly, 60 years had passed. How many internal retellings had smoothed and adjusted the plain words he finally used? Doubtless, it still seemed as clear as on the day itself. The door, the room, the light, the bed, and what was on the bed, a white waxen thing. A small boy and a corpse. Such encounters would not have been so rare in the Edinburgh of his time. High mortality rates and cramped circumstances made for early learning. The house was Catholic, and the body that of Arthur's grandmother, one Catherine Pack. Okay, so that's the opening of the story. It tells us the story of a boy seeing the dead body of his grandmother. Um, so, first of all, it's always going to be useful to think about how it starts, because that is a structural decision. Why start with what you started with? So this, this particular extract starts with a child wants to see it always begins like this so we get told right at the beginning that a child wanted to see something um, and we're not told what it is that he sees there so there is a sense of mystery there now I'm having to write in my my answer about why this opening interests me as a reader so part of the reason it interests me is there's a sense of mystery there's also perhaps a little bit of a sense of sense of dread there's a sense this child is going to see something that is not going to be comfortable to see. He's not likely to see something that's going to be good. It's going to be something that he shouldn't see. So there's a sense of nervousness in the reader. And that any emotional connection that we feel is part of what interests us as readers. We read something, we might feel nervous, we might feel excited, we might uh, feel sorry or sympathy for a character. All those things are, are ways in which we're interested with texts. So I'd quote a little bit of that and talk about how the writer deliberately starts with this uh, vague detail that we're not told what the child sees and it gives us a sense of nervousness 
and a sense of mystery and, and that, that, that would be my opening. So then I think, what does it switch to? So then it starts to talk about him walking into the door. It, not into the door, sorry. Talk about him walking towards the door, pulling down the door handle. So here it, 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 it switches to a description of that. So I'd use that, I'd use that phrase, it switches focus to a description of him walking towards the door. And there is a real slowness about this description. So there's a slowness of the pace. And again, I want to talk about the effect of that slowness of the pace. So we've moved from finding out that he saw something to this slow description of him actually finding it. Um, and again, I want to talk about what effect that has. Why has the writer moved it on to this? So again, I think probably here there is a sense of anticipation, nervous anticipation. We're wondering what it is that he's going to find. We feel maybe a little bit of sympathy for this child. He's probably going to find something that he is, isn't going to like. Okay, then I jump to the next paragraph and it then describes the fact that he, he didn't talk about what he saw for 60 years. So now I'm switching focus and moving 60 odd years forward, well exactly 60 years forward in time. So that's a structural decision to jump forward in time. Now why would you jump forward in time from this moment where he saw something as a young child to 60 years later? Well. Part of the reason you're doing that is because you want to show how profound, how important what he saw was to him, how it, how it sat in his mind for all that time. And still, even though he'd never spoken about it, it was a really vivid memory. Again, I'm probably going to feel sympathy for him. And again, there's still a sense of mystery because I haven't been told yet what it is that he actually saw. So I've talked about it starting with one detail, about this description of him seeing something, then switching focus and slowing the pace down and talking about him actually walking into this room. Then I jump forward 60 years and I'm talking about why would you do that? You know, so that's, that's there's a time shift there. Sometimes text flashback, sometimes they jump forward. This this time it's a jump forward. And then I get a, a then, then I get the reveal. So then we, we move on to the reveal. And at this moment, we, we don't zoom in, we zoom out to be told that this was a regularly common thing in Edinburgh at this time. So we, we, we zoom away from just this one child to find out that actually lots of young children in Edinburgh will have seen a, a dead body at some point in their, in their childhood. And again, why, why, why jump to that? Well, I'm being told that this is not unusual. I, I'm maybe slightly shocked and surprised by the fact that this is so commonplace at this point in history, and I'm, and I'm talking about what the effect is of that movement on. It's, you know, part of it is setting the scene, and that's that's my job, so that, that would be my answer. Those few paragraphs where I talk about the opening, then I talk about the, the slow motion moving into the room, then I talk about the jump forward in time and why the writer did this, all the time just quoting a short little bit between each bit, and then talking about the fact that it, it, it zooms away, it reveals what the detail was and it zooms away from it and tells us how, how not particularly unusual this was to have happened. I hope that's, I hope that's been helpful. Just those, those three phrases again, to switch focus, to zoom in on and to contrast and juxtaposition, they're really useful things to think about. But hopefully what I've talked about there, just about talking about the effect of why writers move from one detail to another detail to another detail to another is the job that you've got to describe when you answer question three on paper one. Okay.